Okay, part D. Wow, I've realized that lecture nine's long, and so uh, lecture ten we're gonna we're gonna keep a bit shorter for lecture ten. But I want to. I think all of this really ties together, so I want to put it in a single longer lecture. And really, we, we've got to take a look at fractional reserve banking, and and what better place to to talk about these different theories of banking, full reserve banking and fractional reserve banking, than the introduction of banking in Renaissance Italy. So let's dive into it. The Medici Bank and other Florentine banks and a bank of Venice, I know the last time, were full reserve banks, meaning that their bank notes and demand deposits, I'll explain that in a moment, were backed 100%. 100% by specie, by coin, gold and silver coin, held physically in the vault of the bank. Held physically in the vault in the bank. Every single one of those liabilities, again, wait for the next slide. Every single one of those liabilities of banknotes and demand deposits are backed by coin in the vault 100%. And this is what the asset liability balance sheet looks like in a full reserve bank. I'm going to use dollars, even though obviously in Florence they're not using the dollar unit of account, but just for the sake of convenience and explaining this, we use dollars. So let's say in at a full reserve bank, we have assets and liabilities. What are liabilities? Well, a banknote is a liability for now we looked at banknotes in part C. Why is a banknote a liability? Well, a banknote is a claim on the bank. The bank is obligated to redeem each of these banknotes, all in this case twenty thousand dollars of banknotes for a coin. And so this is a liability of the bank. It's a liability of the bank, and for the note holder, it's an asset, right? You have this bank note, it's an asset at any time. Oh, I can take it to the bank, bank and get coin, but for the bank, it's a liability. So 20,000. Demand deposits. Um, when a, a, a merchant or any individual deposits money in a the bank, they didn't always receive a bank note. You know, let's say you had $100 worth of coin and you deposit it in a bank. The bank didn't necessarily give you, you know, a hundred dollar bank note. Um, in most cases, they didn't give you any note at all. They just recorded it in your book, in their books. So, you know, for example, I, I bank with Midfirst and at Midfirst Bank, I have demand deposits. I have money in Midfirst that is recorded in their books and they are obligated, sorry, gotta get the... And Midfirst is obligated, sorry, the light turned off, that's why I had to do a little edit there. Midfirst is obligated to, to pay, to, if I come to them and say, I would like my deposit, please, they are obligated to give me that money. So for Midfirst Bank, that's a liability for them. Okay, that's the liability. What is the asset? The asset is the money, okay? The asset's the money in for a full reserve bank. So, you know, when I make, when I when a client deposits money in the bank, let's say they deposit $100, you put $100 on the asset side, now the bank has $100 of cash, but they also have add $100 to their liability. Because now they gotta pay when that client comes and say, I'd like my $100, please, they gotta, they have to, Fulfill that. So, but in a full reserve system, again, it has to be eighty thousand, because that's how many banknotes and how many demand deposits there are. Now, you might ask, well, how then does the bank lend out any money if they have to have all of it in the vault? All eighty thousand dollars of of this coin has to be in the vault. And the answer to that question is time deposits. Time deposits. The bank in a full reserve system will give clients an option. Hey, you can deposit your money and, and agree to give us that money to allow us to use that money for a period of 
90 days, maybe 120 days, maybe even six months, maybe even a year. And the longer the period, the, the greater re reward the depositor gets. Um, and, and during that time period, during that three months or six months or nine months or one year, the bank will take that money and then will invest or will lend it out, will buy bonds, government bonds, corporate bonds, and all sorts of other investments, just you name it, right? All sorts of investments. But any, and, th and this goes on the asset side, and it's an asset because it belongs to the bank. The bank, you know, th these loans, these bonds, other investments, that's an asset of the bank that the bank has. Now, at the end of that time period, then the depositor has claim on that, on any of this money, but you know, uh, perhaps the loan or or bond or whatever has has now matured. But this is the way that in a full reserve system, the bank can can uh, do things with people's money without just keeping it in a vault. It has to be a time deposit. If you have a demand deposit, it's all kept in a vault essentially like a warehouse, right? And so if you want a demand deposit, and you want to store it there, you know, the bank's not going to let you do that for free because nothing's happening except it's just sitting there in a the vault. So you would have had to pay a storage fee, a warehouse fee. We had a time deposit because the bank is able to utilize it and, and invest it. The bank would uh, give you, depending on the length of the time deposit, um, some sum of interest or if interest, uh, uh, you know, what some sort of uh, compensation for being able to use your money for that period for sundry investments. So in a full reserve system, again, uh, depositors will pay a storage fee for their demand deposits instead of receiving interest, or they forfeit the ability to claim their money before a specific time period. And only this money can be utilized by the bank for investments outside of just keeping it in the vault. That's full reserve banking. Now a bank, a full reserve bank can default if one of these loans or bonds goes bad. So, you know, you can't default with this, the species in a vault. The only way it could fail, a bank could fail based on this system is if, uh, you know, a robber breaks in and steals the, steals the money from the vault. In this system, you know, maybe the investment goes bad. And then, ew, what are we going to do about, you know, compensating these guys and, and giving them their money back? So there's some risk there. And, and this is why some of the Florentine banks or the Bank of Genoa either went under or, or serious, serious faced serious challenges when a, when a king or a government repudiated his debts because, you know, that meant, oh, wait, th this isn't an asset anymore. And uh, and so that was big trouble for a bank. Nonetheless, being a full reserve bank, it's fairly, it's it can be a fair, for the most part, fairly stable. Now let's look at fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking, not adopted until later in history, about the 17th century. Although there's some debate about this, about when exactly it happened, but from the research I've done, uh, fractional reserve banking really begins to take off, especially in Holland around the 17th century. And fractional reserve banking is, as it's described, only a fraction of the banknotes, only a fraction of the demand deposits are actually backed by coin held physically in the vault. Okay, only a fraction of the banknotes and only a fraction of the time of the demand deposits are backed by coin held physically in the vault. This isn't an example of a balance sheet for a fractional reserve bank. So here again, we have the liabilities and we'll use the same numbers. $20,000 of banknotes and $80,000 or similar numbers. I guess they're not the same as the last one. $20,000 of banknotes and $80,000 of demand deposits. Now in a full reserve system, you would need $100,000 of specie and it's just gonna sit there in a vault. Just sit there in a vault won't be touched and then whenever a, the holder of a bank note or whenever a client who has demand deposits comes to the bank and asks for the money 
It's there, no question. Instead, the bank says, you know what? Um, we don't need to have every single one of those dollars in the vault because the chance of all of all of the banknote holders, all of the depositors coming all at once and demanding their money is pretty slim. So what do we do? Well, we'll keep 15% in reserve, 15% in reserve, and then we'll utilize the other 85% for loans, bonds, and other investments, okay? Not time, these aren't time deposit monies. These are monies that either the note holder or the depositor has an immediate claim to and can claim, and the bank has an obligation to redeem at any time. But the bank banks on the idea that people are not going to all at once demand this. Now, there are obvious advantages to this system. First of all, this allows banks to, to pay their clients interest on their demand deposits. So instead of having to pay a storage fee, if you want a demand deposit, eh, actually you can receive a small maybe interest payment or some, uh, or some other light compensation. But the most important consequence of this is it expands credit. Credit becomes a lot easier because you don't have to have $100,000 just sitting in the vault. And the, the argument is, well, it's just wasting away. It's just, it's not being used. It's, there's, you know, you're not doing anything with it. It's just sitting there. What good is the money then if it's just sitting there? But if we can take 80, 85% of it and put it in investments, oh, now we're utilizing that money. So that's the big, the big benefit. What's the risk? What if all these people all of a sudden claim their money? And that has happened lots of times in history. We call that a bank run. During the Great Depression, there were bank runs. Runs on the bank. Runs on the bank. So credit is easier or more readily available, but, but, but the bank is more susceptible to bank runs. Huge, huge but there, right? Another uh, uh, benefit to fractional reserve banking from the bank's perspective is you can make more money from fractional reserve banking. Look at all, instead of just having $100,000 in the vault, just sitting there like, oh my gosh, it's just sitting there and, oh, we could be doing all this stuff with this money if only we used it. Under fractional reserve banking, you can use it and the bank will use that 85% and then invest it and the bank's making money off of those investments, all right? The bank will, will profit from the use can profit from the use of that money. So the banks have or a vested interest in a fractional reserve system. It benefits the banks. It also puts the bank in, in, in some risk. And especially when things are, things are beginning to, uh, to get nasty. During a bank run, what does a bank do? If everybody's coming, oh my gosh, we only have 15% actually in the vault. What are we gonna do? Well, what you do, is you sell all of your other assets and you sell them for cash, right? You sell them for cash. So, you know, all these different assets, the bank is going to very desperately and quickly sell, 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 and try to boost this part of the asset column. Here's the problem. If this is a system-wide thing and, and many banks are have are facing bank runs and in there's sort of a crisis in the credit system. If it's system wide and everyone is selling desperately these assets for cash, what what happens? Asset prices are going to plunge. We call these fire sale losses. A fire sale, a fire sale. Just everyone's just trying to desperately sell. And what's going to happen is, you know, you thought you had eighty-five thousand dollars worth of assets, and maybe you did at one point, but now they're not worth eighty-five thousand dollars. The most you can get for it's forty thousand, or even worse, maybe the most you can get from it's like twenty thousand, because all of a sudden everybody's selling, and this is called, you know, we we will say de deflation, deflation in in a deflationary economy, the value of money is going up because there's such a high demand for money. There's a demand for cash and, oh man, such a big subject. 
such a big subject. Uh, demand for cash, and so this can lead to a complete breakdown of the system. See why fractional reserve banking is fraught with some problems, right? So some people throughout history have been very, very against fractional reserve banking. So fractional reserve banking is based on a fiction. It's based on a, on a, on a myth. And some people have gone so far as to claim that fractional reserve banking is fraudulent. And why would they say fractional reserve banking is fraudulent? Fractional reserve banking is fraudulent because the bank claims the bank has $100,000 out there of money claims, claims out there that the bank's going to pay this money, is going to pay this money, but in reality they only have 15% of that. So it's fraudulent, the argument goes, because the bank doesn't have that money. The money is not there. People who watch this video will have different opinions. I'm not, I don't find any problems with fractional reserve banking, but I think you have to, it has to be done with care. <laughs> uh, you don't want to, you know, be, you know, use it, spend that money willy nilly. Um, I don't think there's anything fraudulent about it. If uh, this side of the, you know, of the asset, uh, if this part of the asset side of the balance sheet is, uh, is done wisely and prudently then I think overall you can actually have a very sound banking system and still do fractional reserves. But you know, I historically it's caused it's caused some big, pretty big problems, and uh, so uh, you know, and one of the more most famous bank runs um, is uh, from a, a fictional movie uh, story called uh, "It's a Wonderful Life." It's a Wonderful Life. You may remember. Um, George Bailey, George Bailey faced a bank run. And, and George Bailey, in this clip I'm about to show, it's just a few minutes. In this clip I'm about to show, George Bailey launches into this just epic, epic defense of fractional reserve banking. And I can't help but show it because I think it really captures just the argument in favor of fractional reserve banking, even in the midst of this breakdown of the fractional reserve system. So let's take a look at this clip from It's a Wonderful Life. A run on the bank. Uh, just remember that this thing isn't as black as it appears. <laughs> I love Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart's such a fantastic actor. I have some news for you, folks. I just talked to old man Potter, and he's guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank's going to reopen next week. But, George, I've got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Oh, Charlie, I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. I'll take mine now. No, but you're, 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 you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and, and a hundred others. Now, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I've got $242 in here, and $242 Tom. Oh, my two hundred forty-two dollars. Well, that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Tom, Tom, did you get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay fifty cents on the dollar for every share you've got. <laughs> I've had friends who are uh, anti, who are against fractional reserve banking, who argue that Tom here is actually a hero for demanding his just claim on on the bank. I'm not sure I agree, yeah, but. What do you say? Store, so now he's after us. Why? Well, it's very simple because we're cutting in on his business. That's 
actually I'm going to stop it there uh, but uh, and he goes into Potter's the competitor and, uh, but Jimmy Stewart hey look you know your money's not in the vault I use that money and 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 I use that money for good to build up the community pretty classic scene all right I'm going to stop it there I know lecture nine was long but you know I hope it was useful and uh, I hope you got something good out of it I will see you uh, next time for lecture 10. We are going to, uh, to move forward in, in our study of the history of money. See you then. Bye.